Hello, thank you for coming to be back with us again today. Before we get started in our Bible study, I have a, a little bit of, um, I don't know, housekeeping to, to deal with. Uh, when, we, when we started this, this ministry, when Kevin and I started this, we wanted to give people who are kind of isolated at home a means by which they could get a little preaching and an opportunity for some thoughts with prompts to take the Lord's Supper. And um, and as we started our live streaming on Sunday, th the communion part of it is taken care of. And so uh, wh a question that I have for you is that, uh, is the communion prompts still something that is... Um, that, that you still want on the video since there is the option for the live stream and so that we can dismiss with the communion prompts for this time uh, to maybe let this be something a little different. Uh, Kevin and I still want to do this. We enjoy uh, taping and going over the Word and the time that we have together to bring this to you. Uh, so we want to be involved with that, but if it is not necessary to have the communion prompts anymore, uh, since there is another option for that, uh, then we could streamline this into something more focused. Uh, so if you would, I'm going to give you until next week to just, just put what you would like down in the comments, whether this is on the YouTube page or on the Facebook page. And let us know so that we can make a decision about that. All right. Now, let's set that aside. We're going to talk about Romans 8. In Romans 8, there is this great statement at the very beginning. In Romans 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is no condemnation... For those who are in Christ Jesus. It starts with therefore. And generally in our, in our logic, the way we deal with things, uh, is we will make some arguments building things up. Then we give a therefore. And here's the conclusion. However, in chapter 7, we are left off with Paul saying, I'm doing the very thing I don't want to do. I'm no longer the one doing it, but the sin dwelling within me. I find in the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. I joyfully concur with the law of God and the inner man. Uh, but there is this war that's going on. And he says, wretched man that I am, who will save me from the body of death. And he says, Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Which is the answer? That's who's going to save us. But then he says, So then, on one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other hand, my flesh the law of sin. So we're still caught in this struggle at the end of chapter 7. Paul, with the statement that he makes in chapter 8, verse 1, he is making a statement that he is going to defend. So instead of building an argument, then dropping a therefore, what Paul's going to do is he's making this statement, and then if you will read down in chapter 8, you will see... Verse 2, it starts with 4. Verse 3, it starts with 4. Verse 5, it starts with 4. Verse 6, it starts with 4. Uh, and, and, and then 9, it says, however. <laughs> then you go down in 12. So then, what Paul does is he makes this statement about our place. Then he goes to defend that statement by by building this argument 
in which he goes all the way down to chapter 31, or not chapter, verse 31, where he has this question. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Right? So what Paul does in chapter 8 is it is a defense of the statement he makes in verse 1 that there is no condemnation. And, and I want to I look at that for I want to look at that, but before we do, I want us to understand this idea of condemnation. Paul, in chapters 1 through 7, in one way or another, he has described this court scene in which, uh, over in chapter 2, he says, uh, You have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment you condemn yourselves because you do the exact thing that you're passing judgment on. Verse 2, And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls. Da -da 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 -da. God is this right judge. He is this righteous judge. And he's going to come in judgment. And that judgment is going to come in the form of condemnation. We see in chapter 5, um, in chapter 5, down in verse uh, 18, So then, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men. Well, what is this condemnation? This condemnation is based on the righteous judgment of God. And I, and, I, and I want to make something clear before we go into this judgment, condemnation, and, and, and our being freed from that. God is not this bitter, wrathful, angry old man sitting up behind a bench in heaven waiting, waiting to drop it on everybody. In, in Psalm 96 and in Psalm 98, you can read them for yourselves. It speaks of God going to come with His judgment and bringing equity on all the earth and that the Gentiles and the nations are even going to praise this coming of God in his judgment. And if you think about it like this, uh, think about it like the Old West. Out in the Old West, before there was any law, there was this lawlessness and gunfighters and people doing whatever they want, and might makes right, and all of that kind of idea. And imagine you were in a town that had these robber barons in one side and these gunslingers on the other side. And there's, there's all this, this wild lawlessness going on. And you're, and, and you're in this place that is dangerous to live, but you're stuck there. And all of a sudden, into town comes a judge. And this judge isn't a bitter judge, but he's a judge that's going to bring justice. He's a man that's going to right all the wrongs. He's going to deal with the, the lawlessness and bring this place of safety. And all the people that are underneath the thumbs of this violence and oppression, they say, Thank you, Lord, because we now have, we now have safety and law. 
and we cry out praise. That, that's what this is. We, Paul starts off in, in chapter 1, verses 19, saying that there is this ungodliness and righteousness that's running rampant. And God in his wrath is going to come and he's going to deal with, with that stuff. And even if we're not actively rebelling against God, we're still adding to it. So what, what choice do we have except living underneath this condemnation? How can, how can we be saved, Paul says, from this body of death underneath the condemnation? And he states, chapter 8, verse 1, There is now no condemnation for those in the Messiah, Jesus, the Christ, the Anointed One, God's Chosen One. There is now no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. God's promised from the very beginning in the Gospel, and we talked about it last week, that Whenever sin separated from us from God and we got sent out of the garden, mankind got sent out of God's presence, God promised while we were on the way out, there's coming somebody who's going to deal with this. And that promised one, that Messiah, that anointed one, that Jesus Christ, the Son of David in the flesh, the Son of God, by the Spirit and the resurrection. This Jesus, when you are in Him, there is no condemnation. For, verse 2, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. The condemnation that was on us underneath the law of sin and death has now been done away with with the law of the Spirit of life in Christ. So when we are in Christ, we, have, we are now under this law of life. And so there are these two laws. Now there is this law of life in Christ and there is this law of sin and death. And, and, then, and then verse 3 it says, For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. So you may ask, what was the law wanting to do? <clears throat> what was the law of sin and death wanting to do. Here's a hint. If you read through Psalm 119, that's a quite a lengthy reading. But if you read through Psalm 119, what you'll find is the law wanted to provide life. Because the law is good. The law of the Lord was perfect regarding righteousness. David says, the law of the Lord is a light to your feet and, or a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. It's a way that we could be guided. How are we to protect our youth? The law of God. It's this beautiful thing that as we, as we frame it around our children, they, they will be able to walk in life and goodness and love and right relationship with God. And they were now, they would be an image bearer of God throughout the world as they carry his law with them in their heart. Write your law on my heart so that I might not sin against you. 
the psalmist says. The law was to be this life-giving protector of us and our relationship with God. But it couldn't do it. And you could go back initially to the very first giving of the Ten Commandments. God had set Israel free. God had set them free from the, from, from the Egyptian captivity. He brings them over the Red Sea, which we, we see as a symbol for baptism in, in some places. So they're brought through the water, and they're brought to God's very presence, and he gives them this law. Moses goes up on the mountain for 40 days, and, and, and God writes this on, on these tablets. And whenever Moses comes down with these, with these laws that are good and right and that want to protect us, the first thing he sees is that the people have made an idol. Their ungodliness and their unrighteousness was on display. In the very giving of the law, the first thing that happens is you're condemned. The law never wanted it, but our ungodliness, our unrighteousness, our rebellion puts us in this place. What the law could not do Weak as it was through the flesh, not the flesh of the law, but our flesh. God did it, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. So in, instead of condemning us, he condemns the sin that condemned us. You see? And so that which is condemning us to death, Jesus condemns it through his death on the cross. Verse 4, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What was, the, what was the fulfillment of the law? The law wanted life and goodness and protection, but we couldn't do it because of our sin. But when Jesus died as an offering, now we who are in Christ have the law fulfilled in us by his spirit within us. Verse 5. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the thing of flesh. But those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh, is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it's, even, it's not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, verse 9, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ he does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, this is verse 10, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of the sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. And listen to this great verse in verse 11. Listen to this great verse. But if the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells within you. He who raised Christ Jesus, the Messiah Jesus, from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies 
through His Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under no obligation to the flesh, but to live according to the Spirit. You can read that in verse uh, verse 13. Verse 14, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. This is, isn't that beautiful? You want to know the reason we're not condemned in Christ? It's because God fulfilled the law in Jesus and then extends that to us and gives us life in the Spirit. And through that Spirit, calls us His sons. And we'll look at that next week. Thank you so much for being here. Remember to make your comment down below uh, regarding our business. Thank you. As I have gotten older, I've come to appreciate the simplicity of the gospel. Um, And I see how much the gospel is spoken of in Scripture. In the Old Testament, whether it was promised, in you know the in the the gospel narratives of the story actually taking place or in the explanation of what the gospel means in the letters this moment when Jesus gave himself for us and then was resurrected by the power of God in this moment God's God's love for us is shown. And in that tender moment, in Luke 22, starting in verse 14, uh, Luke says, When the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you that I shall never eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I do not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten and said, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. This moment of communion is a moment of remembrance of that central thing that we believe that saves us, that we proclaim that God loved us so much that He came here and paid the ultimate price so that we could be His. And now as we get ready ready to take the bread, um, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for this This bread, which represents Jesus' body that was given for us, we thank you for your, your rescue plan. We thank you for your willingness and your desire and your strength to make that rescue happen in your Son, Jesus. And we thank you for his willingness to sacrifice himself for us. We thank you for this bread that reminds us of those things. 
And I pray that your story, the gospel story, would be near to our hearts in this moment as we take of it. In Jesus' name, amen. And let us also uh, say a prayer for the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, we continue this prayer thanking you for the cup, which represents Jesus' blood that was shed for us. It is also representative of the covenant that you give us that tells us we are a forgiven people. We thank you for forgiving us. We thank you for rescuing us. We thank you for saving us. And we thank you for Jesus who does all this for us even when we were not worthy of being saved. Thank you for valuing us. Thank you for putting worth on us. And thank you for this blood that cleanses us and washes us as white as snow. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How profound and big of a statement that is that we can now have a life free from guilt, free from the burdens that we uh, try to carry with us, and I pray this week, as you go along, that you will let the message of freedom from condemnation give you peace in your heart as you serve the living God through His Spirit. God loves you, and so do I. Have a wonderful week.